Good to see you, Noel. Thank you very much. Thank you for accepting our invitation. You're very welcome. You're a Maltese resident, are you? I actually am, yes. I'm a Maltese resident now, yes. And how long have you been here? Uh, nearly three years. Are you happy here? Um, yes, I love Malta. It's very interesting. Oh, well, welcome among us. Thank you very much. <laughs> now, let's, uh, talking about um, security, terrorism, what is, how would you define a terrorist today? Who is he? Well, it's very difficult um, to get an international definition of terrorism, namely because there's so many different definitions of terrorism. The problem is it's very difficult to build that into the international system, the international laws, because in one country, a terrorism is a freedom fighter. Mm -hmm. So it depends on the international definition. Therefore, because the world can't reach a consensus of what is a terrorist, what is terrorism, and to terrorize, mm -hmm. it becomes difficult to enshrine it into law and find what is a criminal act, what is a terrorist act, mm -hmm. and therein lies the problem with the international system as we know well, it. That's that basically it. What is a terrorist act? We've heard the Prime Minister May um, say that he was British born. Yes. So this is got, the days have gone by where we're having wars fought by men in uniform against each yes. other where they could, there's a clear distinction. Yes, yes. Um, so w what's happened to the world? Well it's pretty interesting when people say what is a terrorist act? Well in my 25 years of studying uh, universities around the world and I go quite a lot around the world, for me uh, what we need is a working definition of what is a terrorist. A right. terrorist is someone who chooses to target innocent people. Okay. It is simple as that. The governments, the people, the elected representatives are all protected with firearms, bodyguards, all this. So terrorism is a grassroots movement. It's a phenomenon. Mm -hmm. So what happens is when people create tax on innocent people because they are the ones who elect representatives in the yes. state and they're also the weakness in society because they're the ones who put people in position. Mm -hmm. Therefore, that's why the people become targeted because it's they will change the political landscape. So, in the absence of a clear definition of what is a terrorist or yes. who is the terrorist yes. within us, yes. how do you protect the citizens? It's, well, it's very difficult, but you have to look at reinterpreting what is security, what is safety. Internationally, you have different countries basically operating on a frolic of their own. So you have countries operating, protecting themselves, when in actual fact our way to secure and protect basically needs to come from an integrated approach. So when the international community works together, for example, the United Nations has a definition of terrorism which doesn't sit very well with other countries that have different types of laws, therefore we can't share intelligence, we can't get information across. Some countries do it, some countries won't do it because they want to protect their citizens. But I think when we start looking at ourselves as a global community, we need to start looking a bit better at open and sharing intelligence sources and resources to help us protect. But I would like to say what we really need to do is start reinterpreting how we look at security. Mm -hmm. I think the word security we're coming out from a failed perspective. We should be talking resilience now. Mm. We need to look and associate ourselves where our world has changed dramatically. From World War One, World War Two, 9-11, yes. different punctuations. Yeah. Now we still wish to move freely but our definition and protect, we demand big protection mm -hmm. but we also have to understand that we have to change the ways in which we operate, the way we move around, but the way we For example, we, we, we're seeing footage on, on TV right now. These are the French uh, police officers yes. who were engaged in the protection of citizens, unfortunately, uh, many many died in the attacks on the Charlie Hebdo, on the, uh, on, the, on, the, on, the on the on the concert hall where there was a, a concert going on, and a, and a man went in. We were firing firing a weapon. Um, but how can you protect? A country or the citizens when you cannot foresee what's in the mind of a lone gunman. Absolutely, and therein lies the secret to this. You're not dealing with uniformed people, insurgents who wish to upset the status quo of a society wearing insignia and uniforms. Yeah. This is 50 million people in certain countries, all with a mind of their own, who don't have to buy firearms. You can use a kitchen knife, so yes. the ways in which they're doing the attacks has changed, and we need to keep more aware of that. Now, with the Charlie Hebdo, which all these, do we really Want to, if you look at the face of modern policing in Europe now, you're looking at French commandos arc, at the Arc de Triomphe. Uh -huh. Now they're talking about the Eiffel Tower needing bulletproof cladding to actually stop people attacking the icons of our democracy yes. and our uh, evolution. However, do people really want to see armed commandos on the streets? What's it telling the people? Exactly. Now we have to reach a balance. We have to make what we call mm -hmm. the visible, invisible, and still have those level of resources. Because when you see armed men, heavily armed soldiers, on every European capital well, now... Russia's also locked down last year. Absolutely, it's locked down. So what's happening to our way of life? So we have to realise everything has changed. We need to look at the way we look at policing, intelligence gathering, how we share. But we can actually take action and protective measures to look after these public places. We do know now that we want safety. We complain about aeroplanes that won't allow us to travel mm -hmm. with water. But yet we expect to be protected in those aeroplanes. 
airlines, terrorists are still fascinated with using but airplanes. But obviously, security comes at a cost. As security comes, and often it's a big grudge, cost. It comes at a grudge purchase. So what happens is people only think secondary security. Uh -huh. Oh, uh, I'm in trouble. I need security now. But this is the problem. We have to think security. We have to think resilience. We have to really reinterpret again how we can travel human rights because. You know, where are the rights of people who are actually killed in terrorist attacks? Mm. We talk about human rights of people who commit terrorism, whatever religion commits these acts or religious mm -hmm. political background, mm -hmm. but we also have to look about the political rights and the human rights of the people that have been attacked. Mm. And this is where when we move into like critical infrastructure, airplanes, trains, automobiles, how we travel, the terrorists know, being, now I say terrorist, man, woman or child, Yes. we've seen this quite a lot, they know where people want to congregate so wherever we have large groups of people is that's it, where a, they want a security risk absolutely wherever they can create mass casualties a sense mm -hmm. of propaganda all these and, factors um, talking about mass casualties uh, we're marking one year from the tax in yes. in, in brussels we had a Maltese uh, citizen who was injured uh, at the airport in brussels last year and uh, we actually spoke to him over the past hours in brussels and he stood near the uh, the monument which is commemorating the um, uh, the fallen in yes. that attack um, and he speaks about the, um, the psychological effect yes. it has had on him. We've heard uh, Lorenzo talk about the paranoia that hits uh, a victim of a terror attack, which he has to carry this, um, this trauma mm -hmm. uh, of fear. Um, his life changes, his mm -hmm. family's life cha changes. Uh, the way he approaches an airport, obviously he's a diplomat, he needs an airport, he needs to travel. Um, so he also says he needs to be accompanied by a psychologist every time he goes to an airport. Is it that serious now to reach such levels that people can't travel safely anymore? Well, let me just give you a bit of my own experience. When I was nine years old, I went to a shop simply one day, just a normal day, and uh, I went to a shop and there was an armed robbery in that shop, and I had a shotgun stuck to my head as a child going to get some bread for my mother. Yes. This is in lovely old Ireland. Right. Um, and in that moment, I was beaten with a shotgun I stuck to my head, and uh, that moment has stayed with me forever. Now, I've learned to deal with that over the years, and I made it my life's mission to make sure, as long as I live, I will prevent those types of activities happening to oh, people internationally. <laughs> and it's really important to me, but I have to say, the mental and psychological scarring will never leave. There are children. I need to point out that these attacks in Brussels, Paris, they're happening on a daily basis mm -hmm. around the world. There's children in other countries that can't sit properly because they have pieces of shrapnel in yes. their legs. It's something that never, ever lives. It never leaves you, mentally and physically. All mm -hmm. we can do is adapt, and that's the key. We need to learn to adapt. The police will have to adapt, the armed forces have to adapt, they're doing a fantastic job, of even in this country, they keep us safe. They're overstretched. They're overstretched, and you can see the overstretching, but what happens to happen is now, the people, and I talk to Paulus, the people of a state, need to learn that, yes, we can't depend on these people to protect us all the time, we need to look. And I give advice to people who contact me all the time, where should I go on holidays? I'm afraid of being blown up. And my advice is simple. Um, when you go to a country, if you have to go there, don't just wait for somebody to say, this is a good holiday. Check it out. Look it out. Advise yourself where is the best place to go. And if there's a fear while you're there, you identify where the amount of people congregate together. Yes. Where's the most exclusive place? You must see it, you must identify it, and you must stay away from it. Mm. You have to stay anywhere we can get large congregations of people. That's where you're going to see but these didn't collections. But can you get the incidents like in, uh, in Germany? Where you yes. get a big lorry, or in France, a big yeah. lorry that just decides to drive through um, mm -hmm. the crowds. Well, I'm very sorry, I mean, but we've seen attacks like this many times. And when you are protecting, and this is most important again with mass groups of people, we need to see that we have had these types of attacks around the world. People will use all kinds of weapons for their durability and the body part for its vulnerability. Now, the thing is, vehicles they should not be entering into confined spaces. They should have what we call protected zones, mm -hmm. buffer zones. Even coming into protected areas, we need to reinterpret. Well, Berlin. We can still protect, we can still look after ourselves, but we need to work and be more aware of our own surroundings. Mm. Cope, self-defense, self-protection means coping with threat in your environment. Being our aware. Envir yes, being aware, not being paranoid, but this will take a long time to change, but we can navigate these waters. Mm. A common question asked by many, especially now that we've heard the Prime Minister in the UK say uh, he, the, the, the assailant was known by the police. Many times, for example, yeah. Brussels and Paris have such a common denominator. They are the same foreign fighters which returned from Iraq and Afghanistan and yet they've committed the crimes they knew, they, uh, the authorities knew they would have probably done. 
absolutely. We, uh, we've known for quite some time that people will be returning from foreign. Remember, every carnivore has its infancy. These people go to these countries with no experience of fighting. You learn very, very quick in combat situations. You'll have seen that from mm -hmm. your own time in, in different countries. But when they return, they're not going to take up gardening. You know, we have a lot of people <laughs> that are radicalized. They're not yeah. going to go watering flowers. Yeah. What's going to happen is these people I, again, and I'm speaking, we talk about in a conventional way, we're talking about the war and the fall of Mosul against the remnants yes. of ISIS, ISIL. Now, in any form of asymmetrical type of conflict, if they know they're going to be surrounded by conventional armies, it would be logical that they would actually depart that land into foreign countries already, which is already happening. So what we're seeing is a dying breed of an organization or an organization franchise mm -hmm. where the fighters have already moved. So therefore, how are police officers going to be on street corners in doing a nice hello, welcome to our country against hardened, battle-hardened men, women and children who are programmed True. and radicalized to go mm. and carry out these acts of horrific terror. And it's designed. Mm. When they planned 9-11, you can be guaranteed in the caves of Afghanistan, they knew that there will be news helicopters circling around all the various parts of America to videotape these attacks. Therefore, we have a perpetual rewind of these yes. attacks over yeah, and over. The, the, so even the, the media, of today's media, absolutely, the media has yeah. a role to play my, in this. My, uh, my final question is this. Uh, many people point fingers just uh, exclusively to, to Islam. Yes. as the main um, instigators or the people who, who commit such crimes are Muslims. Should they actually be engaged in that in the sense that should they point fingers specifically to one religion? I have to say this, I travel the world, I am not of the Islamic faith, but I can say this, in 1940, when the Japanese bombed Pearl Harbor, the, J the Americans put the Japanese prisoners into prisoner of war camps, the internment, yes. and many Japanese people fought for the freedom of America. But what happens is when you subjugate all these people, Islam is not at war with the West. We have radicalism, we have left-wing extremism, we have Christian terrorism, we have Zionist terror, we've had a history, the world knows about terror. But when we start boxing people into protective boxes, if you look at any battle in Iraq, you go to the foreign countries of Islamic countries, I guarantee you will find that people are very terrified of this. This is the, what you call it in Islamic uh, countries, the Ummah, the Islamic community of people. They are very terrified. They want to do something. And I can tell you, if you do the statistics, you will find that there are more people of the Islamic faith are dying than Christians or Jewish people at this moment in time. You, all you have to do is look at the statistics, do a quantitative and cumulative assessment, you will find that if we keep hustling and saying Islam, 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 you can say it's Islam wrong. is a religious of faith, it's a religion of peace. We are dealing with extremists. Mm -hmm. We are fundamentalists who fundamentally have a belief, like the Christian faith and other faiths, Sorry. like the Buddhist faith, we have a fundamental belief in this. But are we willing to bend other people to your will to be a radicalist extremist? That's the difference. That's the challenge. This comes down to education. If people cannot feel, read and interpret the word for themselves, they will listen to radical interpretations. And we must not just look at uneducation, this. We had people who are medically trained people who take the Hippocratic Oath to protect lives, who tried to bomb the UK before by yes. going into an airport. These are doctors. So this is all ranges of the spectrum, man, woman and child. We cannot just look here. This terrorism is a phenomenon. It's not something that's solid. We can look here. This is yeah. the target. We have to understand it as a phenomenon. It's a political activity. I believe Aristotle says, man, or politics is about people coming together to live, but not just to live, but to live well. Mm -hmm. So we have lessons from the ancient world. So what happens when people don't live well and coexist together? Well, this is about propaganda. Yeah. This is about terrorism. <laughs> this is about, Mark, this is all the different factors. We really need to reinterpret what is terror, what terrorizes and terrorism. We have to separate these three factors. We can't have a knee-jerk reaction every time there's an attack. These attacks are happening on a daily basis. In fact, if you look in every newspaper of all the 500 words that are used in language every day, how many have terror? Terror, 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 terror. Yeah. And what is terror? Where does terrorism come from? In actual fact, the word terrorism comes from the French Revolution, the period of terror, where the period of the Committee of Public Safety decided that they will execute people with a guillotine if they don't perform in a very patriotic way. And thousands of people died in a short period of time. Now, that's interesting. People were executed in front of the uh, Civil National Assembly in Paris, in front of everyone. So how do we keep people subjugated? We keep them in terror. So you yes. feel it in here, you see it here, you behave.
behave. So can we go? We will not allow this, as Theresa May rightly said, to allow our way of life. I am a man, I am a free man, I have two children, I bring my children up properly to respect other people and I expect that. However, not everyone thinks as we do. Our objective is terrorists will think like us. They will go and they will create havoc, pandemonium, chaos. That's what you see after these attacks. So we have to reverse engineer how we defend against these mm -hmm. attacks. What's the point in waiting for someone to go into a train station to shoot people? Why don't we reverse engineer this train station that if there is an attack, we can actually contain it, we can manufacture glass equipment to stop and minimize the effect? Yes. Because this is not going to stop. I am an optimist, but I have to think like a pessimist. Uh-huh. <laughs> a pessimist is just a well-informed optimist. <laughs> I like so we that. have to think. <laughs> it's not going to change, but we have to adjust the way we do things. It's the same. I leave for the Far East uh, next week. It's the same. They're all ter you go to Dubai, you go to these countries, Indonesia. Yes. The people are really frightened. And it's not just here. It's everywhere. But the answers lie in the questions. Yeah. How can we allow people to manoeuvre freely, enjoy their freedom, but we do realise we have to take precautions. We can't just leave a, for, I mean, for the police force of Malta, I've seen them do fantastic functions here, big concerts, 20, 30,000 people, and they do a great job. But we have to think in advance. Yes. What are we going to do if? Not, oh, here we are. We have to be proactive and not reactive. Noel Whelan, thank you so thank much you for your time. Much. Very enlightening indeed. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir.